Okay, welcome to lecture 13. Uh, this is going to be the first in three lectures, or three or four lectures, about spectral graph theory. And I put here a nice resource for the topic is Dan Spielman's newest book, uh, Spectral and Algebraic Graph Theory. So uh, spectral graph theory is a really nice topic to study in a CS theory uh, toolkit class. And one reason for it is that it's a topic that's equally beloved by complexity theorists and algorithmic theorists, uh, the two main camps in the area. Uh, spectral graph theory intersects with both of uh, these camps' interests, so it's a, it's a nice uh, central topic. Uh, another nice thing about it, as we'll see, is it connects to a lot of just interesting things uh, not immediately related to uh, spectral theory, like expander graphs, and uh, the sparseness cut problem, maxness cut problem, even the unique games problem, and other such things. Okay, so in some sense, uh, spectral graph theory is about the study of graphs, and it's going to be only about, for us, the study of undirected graphs. So we're going to always assume we have an undirected graph, G, vertex set V and edge set E. Uh, there are extensions to, undirect, or to directed graphs, but we won't talk about them in these lectures. We will make some assumptions about this uh, graph that we work with. First of all, it'll, we'll assume it's a finite graph. Um, there's also extensions of spectral graph theory to infinite graphs, but we'll uh, stick with finite graphs. Um, we're going to actually allow multiple parallel edges, and we're going to also allow self-loops. So these are two annoyances that you know sometimes people like to disallow. But I think it's actually nice in spectral graph theory to allow both of these uh, things. Uh, on the other hand, we are going to disallow something. We're going to disallow um, vertices of degree 0, Okay, isolated vertices, as they're called. I mean, these are generally pretty pointless uh, in a graph. It has a bunch of extra vertices not connected to anything lying around. And so, or indeed, we're going to just uh, not allow them. It'll make things convenient. Uh, okay, and I should mention that when I'm mentioning uh, degree, of course, uh, let me just draw a quick example of a graph here with five vertices. Uh, the degree of a vertex is just the number of edges that it touches. So maybe here's a example graph, and maybe I have three parallel edges here, and maybe also a self-loop on this vertex. So self-loops uh, generally count for one on a vertex. So this particular vertex here with all the action going on has degree uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to actually be dealing in these lectures with not necessarily regular graphs. And I want to um, mention a key point, which is this, if this is the first or second or third time you've been studying spectral graph theory, it's really a very useful, helpful uh, suggestion simplifying suggestion to assume that the graph is regular. This makes things a lot um, less complicated. So let me say, if you've never seen this before, maybe assume that the graph is regular, okay? And um, meaning all the vertices have the same degree. And this will definitely simplify your life. So I'm gonna carry out everything uh, in the case that it's not necessarily regular. But uh, if, as I said, if it's the first few times you've studied spectral graph theory, just stick with the, the, the regular case in your head. Okay, so um, yeah, as I said, you can generalize this to infinite graphs or directed graphs or uh, reversible Markov chains, um, but okay, we'll just stick with undirected graphs for the remainder of these lectures. Okay, so we're imagining we have a graph on our hands, um, but more than this, the main object we're gonna be studying is actually um, labelings of the graph vertices by real numbers. So uh, as I say, the key or a key thing that we'll be studying is labelings of vertices, uh, V, by real numbers. And you may think of this, and we will, as actually functions mapping the vertex set V into the real numbers. Okay, so this will be a central object of study for us given an undirected graph. Okay, and... Um, these kind of objects, uh, functions, or labelings arise naturally. So, I mean, some examples might include um, maybe if the, the graph is modeling some physical object, maybe F is uh, the temperature of the vertex, or uh, maybe the voltage, if it's some kind of electrical network, or maybe um, if you're embedding these graphs into real space, then perhaps F might be a coordinate in an embedding of this graph into 
R2 or R3 or RD, something like that. Um, F might be the zero one indicator of a subset of vertices. This will be a very common example for us. If we're studying a graph, we'll have a subset of S of vertices at hand and we'll let F be the function that assigns one to the vertices in S and zero to the vertices outside S and so forth. So there are many examples of uh, these kinds of uh, functions, mapping vertices to real numbers. And uh, not only will we think of them as vertices, we'll also at the same time think of these functions as vectors. In particular, um, let's think of them as column vectors. Okay, so our vectors will look like this. And in spectral graph theory, we'll, we'll be associating uh, vertices and matrices and things, sorry, vectors and matrices and things to graphs. Um, the coordinates or entries will always be indexed by the set of vertices. So it's convenient if the vertices are called one through n, uh, but this is not necessary. In general, we'll be, um, you know, indexing, let's say, column entries by vertices. And then um, we can imagine f's value uh, on each of the vertices plugged into the column vector. Okay, so given a function f, you just arrange all of its values on the n vertices into a column vector, and that's uh, how we think of the function as a vector. Now, uh, as I said, this uh, spectral graph theory is kind of a, um, a linear algebra type topic, and we have vectors involved now. And so, of course, it's good to point out that, um, well, we can uh, do linear operations on these uh, functions or vectors. So we can add to functions pointwise. If we have two functions on the vertices f and g, we can form the, the uh, sum of them, f plus g. This is the pointwise or vertexwise um, sum of these functions. And we can also multiply them by scalars. Okay, so for any real number c, um, you can look at um, C times F. Um, okay, and therefore, you know, because we have these basic operations of scalar multiplication and addition, we can think of the collection of all functions mapping the vertex set of a fixed graph into real numbers as a vector space, a real vector space. And of course that makes sense because um, well, we also said we could think of these functions as vectors, so naturally they're vector space. And it'll also be important to know what is the dimension of this vector space. And of course, the dimension of this vector space is n. Uh, in particular, it's uh, the number of vertices, which we typically denote by n. Okay, so that's how you, uh, given a fixed graph, G, on n vertices, uh, you think about functions on the vertices or labelings of the vertices by real numbers and how you think of these as um, vectors of length n indexed by the, the um, vectors of the graph. Okay, and now um, what I'd like to tell you is what I view as the absolute key to spectral graph theory. Okay, so I'll even write it in uh, kind of big capital letters here. Key to spectral graph theory. And what this is, is actually a uh, way of um, taking a function on the vertices and condensing it down to a key single real number, a non-negative real number. And it's sort of the average uh, squared difference of f's values along edges. Okay, so I'll write that in um, more math symbols. So we're going to look at the average or expectation of a, a random edge in the graph. So I'm going to write this like this, uh, u tilde v. And this means that what's going on here, the probabilistic experiment, is that we're choosing a uniformly random undirected edge uh, uv in the graph. Sorry, it's a little inconvenient here that e stands for expectation and um, the edge set. And I'll come back to this in a second, but uh, let me go on with the, the quantity here. So we're picking a random edge uv, 
And then what we're going to do, do, given a function f on the vertices, is look at f of u. And we're going to look at f of v. And we'll subtract them to get their difference. And much like when you have uh, the variance of a random variable, you kind of want to look at their difference. Um, you want to look at a non-negative quantity, but it's annoying to look at absolute values. So you instead, as in variance, uh, square the quantity. Okay, So this is going to be a key quantity for us, the average over all edges, uv, of the square difference of f's value at u and f's value at v. Okay, Actually, um, for reasons of making subsequent formulas a little nicer, we also put a factor of a half in front. And you'll actually see later why that's natural, but um, don't worry about it too much for now. If you decide not to put this factor, it's fine. Uh, but let's put the factor in. And we need some notation for this quantity. And we also need a name for this quantity. And uh, this is a really challenging topic. No one has like a super great name for this quantity. Um, so I'll tell you my names and uh, we'll settle on one of these possibilities as we go on. Let's start with notation. So for the purposes of these lectures, I'm going to write this uh, key, key quantity as um, curly E or a calligraphic E of F. Okay, I think historically and mathematically, uh, the E here, this curly E is standing for energy because it's some kind of um, energy in the graph. I think maybe if it really is the energy, if the Fs represent voltages or something, but I don't know anything about physics or electronics, so never mind about that. Uh, right, so as I said, um, it's a difficult question what to call this very important uh, quantity. Um, some names include the Dirichlet form of the graph, um, or a name that uh, not many people use, although I like it, is the local variance of the graph. Because in a sense, as I said, it looks very much like the um, variance, the expression for variance, and in fact, uh, if you have the complete graph with self loops, um, then this really would be the variance of the random variable f of u when u is a random vertex. Uh, but this comes with some kind of like local version because you don't look at all pairs of um, f values. You only look at ones uh, f values along edges. Um, one might also call this, and we'll see why later, the analytic boundary size of f. That will make sense if, um, or make more sense if we think of f as the zero one indicator of a subset of vertices. Um, maybe another common name is like the Laplacian quadratic form. This is some kind of quadratic form uh, in the function value. So we have all these names. Uh, maybe let's just call it the quadratic form for the graph. Perhaps that's the best thing to call it. Anyway, it's a very important quantity and we'll uh, spend a fair bit of time studying it. Uh, just one more little um, comment here about this topic of choosing a uniformly random edge. Uh, I've actually written um, u comma v here in round brackets as if the vertices are ordered. Now in an undirected graph, we normally think of um, the edges as being unordered. I mean, I mean a, an edge and its reverse are always considered in there. But what's actually very typically nice in spectral graph theory is to stick with undirected graphs for sure, but to sort of in your mind think of each undirected edge as a pair of opposing directed edges. So one going from u to v and one going from v to u. And um, it's really good to think of that even in this experiment where you're choosing a random uh, edge, u, v in the graph, really think of it as like half the time you're choosing the directed edge that goes from u to v and half the time you're choosing the directed edge that goes from v to u, okay? It's not really important for this thing because in any case, what we do with this quantity is uh, symmetric between u and v. We plug them into f and take the difference in square. So this is something good to keep in mind. Okay, so this is a quantity uh, that is gonna be great to study. So let's learn some basic facts about it. Let me erase all this business about its name, which is a little bit annoying. We'll just call it the quadratic form for the graph. Okay, so this is some kind of functional um, associated with the graph. It takes in a function of the vertices and spits out a number. So let's learn some facts about this quadratic form. 
And these are facts that are actually going to remind you of facts about variance in probability theory. Okay, so one very basic fact is this quadratic form value is always non-negative. And of course, that's obvious because uh, it's the average of some squares of things, so a square is always non-negative. Okay, another neat thing to think about is how does this uh, quantity scale if we do a scalar multiplication? So if we take some function f and we multiply it by 3, multiply all the function values by 3, then you can kind of see from the expression that um, the quadratic form value mul gets multiplied by 9. Okay, in general, the quadratic formula of uh, c times f is c squared times the quadratic form value for f. You know, so it's product property shared by variance in probability theory. And one more example here, or one more fact, the quadratic form value for a function plus a constant. Okay, so if you just take the same constant value 10 and you add it to f's values on every vertex, that actually does not change the quadratic form value at all because, you know, it just gets subtract 10 here, and, or sorry, plus 10 here and plus 10 here, and these cancel out when you subtract. Okay, so um, just like variance, it's invariant to uh, translation. Okay, and um, perhaps the key intuition to keep in mind for this quantity is that um, it's small, in quotes. This quadratic form value is small uh, if and only if f's values are somehow smooth in that they don't vary much along edges. F's uh, values, let's say, don't very much, much in quotes, along edges. Okay, so F might overall have somewhat widely differing values, but if, you know, they don't change too much as you walk along edges, this will be the situation where uh, the quadratic form value is not that large. Okay, good. So uh, let's do some concrete examples. And perhaps the most important concrete example is one I alluded to before, where um, we think of uh, f as the indicator for a subset of vertices. So let's check out this key example. So let's assume we have some subset of vertices s. And we're going to uh, let f be, I'll write it like this, the indicator function for this subset of vertices. Okay, so that just simply means that f on a vertex u is 1 if u is in the set, and 0 if u is not in the set. Okay, now let's compute the quadratic form for <coughs> this function. Okay, so in this case, uh, we have this quadratic form of f. So what's the formula? Okay, we have this perhaps annoying factor of a half at the beginning. Okay, times the expected value or the average value over a random edge uv of uh, f's value at u minus f's value of v squared. So let's plug in f's value at u is the indicator of s on u minus the indicator uh, function of s on v squared. Okay, and what is this quantity? Well, um, these two numbers here are both 1 or 0. So if they're the same value, both 1 or both 0, then their difference is 0, the square is 0, so we don't count anything. On the other hand, if they're different values, 1 is 1 and 1 is 0, well, then the difference is plus or minus 1, but anyway, the square is 1. So in the expectation, you count 1. So really, this is uh, counting half times the expected value of a random edge of the indicator random variable that u and v are on opposite sides of the partition, s and s complement. Okay, so this is sometimes uh, written as um, the indicator for the event that u, v crosses the cut defined by s and its complement. Okay, so it's the probability you pick a random edge that it straddles uh, being inside and outside s. Okay, or now that we have the expectation of an indicator, this just means uh, the, the probability that the event being indicated occurs. This is half times the fraction of edges that are on, I'll write it like this, 
um, this thing means the boundary of x. Okay, so this is all the edges uh, that have one vertex inside s and one vertex outside of s. Okay, and we're looking at the fraction of all the edges which have this property that they're on the boundary times one half. And uh, just to draw a little picture here, let's say our graph uh, somehow looks like this. This is our graph G and our subset of vertices S, which is these vertices. Okay, so G has some edges that are not on the boundary. They're either inside or outside. But then G has some edges that are on the boundary. These yellow ones here are the ones that are on the boundary. So we're looking at the fraction of all edges that are um, on the boundary. And um, now you might think, uh, man, it's annoying that we have this annoying factor of a half outside. But actually, the factor of half is quite nice and natural. Because again, you should think of the um, undirected edges in the graph as being really a pair of directed edges, one that goes from u to v and one that goes from v to u. So um, half of the fraction of undirected edges on the boundary is kind of like you're counting just the directed edges going from inside to outside. Okay, So um, that's actually nice. Again, if you think of all undirected edges as two uh, directed edges, then we're looking at um, edges that go from inside to outside. So another way to write this quantity is the probability, if I choose a random edge uv, but um, think of it as kind of directed, that um, the directed edge from u to v is like stepping out of s, if you will. In other words, that u is in s and v is outside s. But the probability that um, if you take a random directed edge that you're stepping from being inside s to outside s. And really, this is something that, um, well, just generally, this notion of the boundary size, the edge boundary size of a set s in a graph is something that we care about a lot. I mean, algorithmically, we care a lot about finding small cuts in graphs, partitioning graphs into sets of vertices so there are not a lot of edges crossing the partition, finding communities, et cetera, in, in social network graphs. So uh, this boundary size of a set of vertices S is very important. And it's a special case of this quadratic form value when the, the functions you look at are restricted to 0, 1 indicators of vertex sets.